Okay, well, uh, <coughs> good evening, everybody, and thanks for turning out to what is now the third of the series of public lectures that we're staging, or the University of Stirling is staging, under the Regis Services Project Knowledge Beyond Natural Science, um, which we're running with the sponsorship of the John Templeton Foundation. The focus of the project is on areas of our knowledge, or apparent knowledge, which on the face of it seems to be arrived at unscientifically which pose problems for scientific explanation. So they include in particular <coughs> self-knowledge, knowledge of basic logic and mathematics, and knowledge of ethics, which we're just close to this <coughs> evening. Uh, almost everyone here, I think, is a philosophy profession. And to those, Paul McGoes needs an introduction. Uh, but for anyone who isn't, I'll give an introduction anyway. Uh, Paul is um, Julius Silver Professor at New York University, where he's also director of the New York Institute of Philosophy, and director of the NYU Global Institute for Advanced Study. Sounds correct title. Um, he has an extensive and highly influential record of research publication in areas broadly of overlap between philosophy of mind, philosophy of logic, philosophy of content, and epistemology. But also, um, unlike many of his peers, an accomplished track record in public philosophy marked in particular by his book in 2006, uh, Fear of Knowledge, in which he takes on the absurd interest in relativistic ideas. And that's what we're on this evening. Um, I would say that that book uh, is highly unusual for its combination, which Paul will illustrate again this evening, um, of highly sophisticated leading edge argumentation coupled with accessible prose so that any careful reader with or without philosophical training should be able to follow all the details with a bit of patience. So, without further ado, let me invite Paul to tell us whether we should be relativists about ethics. Kristen, thank you very much for the very kind introduction, and thank you for the project for inviting me to give this lecture. I really prefer introductions that manage expectations a little bit better than that. <laughs> I'll work with it as best I can. Um, I want to consider these two statements that are on the handout to begin with. Uh, one, it is morally right to educate girls and young women. And two, Earth is spherical. Now, um, two is what we call a descriptive statement describes the state of affairs, and it is capable of being uh, called simply true or false. Uh, and it's also easy for us, roughly, to have a sense of what it is in virtue of which it is true or false. It has a truth maker, namely the shape of the earth. This truth maker need not itself be something simple or not further reducible. The truth maker to two is Earth, as we said, but that in turn might depend on all kinds of other facts, complicated facts about the distribution of particles and so forth. But the point is, we have a handle on this truth maker for its statement like two. Furthermore, and partly because we have such a good handle on it, uh, we know how to go about settling or coming to know whether two is true through fairly well understood methods. By contrast with statement two, though, statement one is normative, or evaluative, or descriptive. These are subtle differences between these different terms, but they won't matter for present purposes. Moral judgments do not say how things are, but how they ought to be. We shouldn't expect a definition of normativity in descriptive or non-normative terms. At some level, I think it's quite clear that the notion of normativity is a conceptual primitive. But we recognize the normativity of the judgment through the presence or absence of what are canonical normative terms, terms like ought, or not, good, bad, right, wrong, has a reason to, has no reason to, um, and so forth. Uh, in addition to these canonically normative terms, there are other concepts that are also normative, but perhaps slightly hidden that they are so, and that it might take some analysis to reveal that they are. The word beautiful, for instance, is like that. It's the notion of 
deserving to be uh, appreciated in a certain way, or rational to believe is, is also like that, and that I'll make something of later on, courageous, cowardly, and so forth. Now, I want to go back to, to, to statement one, uh, the normative statement, moral judgment, and ask whether we can treat it in the same way as we treated statement two. That is, can we say, A, that one, like two, is capable of being simply true or false, that it has a truth maker, and B, that we can come to know its truth maker through well understood methods. I think if you examine ordinary moral judgment, practice with moral judgments, I think it's quite plausible that we certainly believe both A and B. That is, we behave with respect to a normative statement very much in the same way as we behave with respect to a um, descriptive statement. If I come across someone who denies one, and there are people who deny one, I think they believe something false uh, when they say, no, it's not moral right to educate uh, girls and young women. This suggests that I believe there is a fact of the matter that decides which of us in this disagreement is correct, and of course I believe that I am. Naturally, my opponent will believe the same about himself, but that just shows that we're both, in my sense, objectivists about the subject matter of one. We both believe that there is a fact of the matter and that it's possible for us to know that fact. What we disagree is which of us knows the fact. This contrasts with how we would behave in the case of some other judgments. For example, with respect to basic gustatory taste judgments. Brussels sprouts are delicious, for example which you will notice has a kind of objective syntax because it's attributing a property to the Brussels sprouts, um, namely being delicious. We nonetheless take a much more tolerant attitude about that disagreement. Um, indeed, it's not even clear that we treat these disagreements as real disagreements at all. In this case, <coughs> excuse me, we don't act as though we believe there is a fact of the matter about whether Brussels sprouts are really delicious or not. We don't think there are any facts about what is really delicious. If I like them, that's fine. However, if you don't like them, I don't treat you as having made a factual mistake. I might think it's a shame that you don't get the same pleasure as I do from Brussels sprouts, but I don't think that I'm recognizing an objective fact where you are not. Our behavior towards one moral judgment also contrasts with the way we would treat a seeming disagreement about the statement four, which is, you should not eat noisily. This statement of etiquette we regard as true in certain cultural settings, in Edinburgh maybe, but false in others, say Beijing, where it is often polite to show how much you're enjoying your food by eating it with a certain amount of noisy relish. But I don't similarly regard it as an appropriately culturally variable matter whether girls should receive educations. So in sum, my ordinary attitude towards disagreement about the moral judgment of one is much closer to the way I treat disagreements about the descriptive statement two than it is about three or four. Now, um, the question, so that's so much for the ordinary attitude that we evince when we come across disagreements about these statements. The question is, is it sustainable, this ordinary uh, attitude? Is it ultimately defensible? There is, of course, a substantial in influential philosophical tradition that holds that an objectivism about morality is not defensible. Philosophers in this tradition point to two classes of problem, one metaphysical, one epistemological. On the metaphysical side, they say, what could the truth maker for something like one possibly be? Perhaps you think that one itself is derived from some more general principle, that men and women of equal human dignity and, and, and worth. How could it be right to award such an important opportunity to males while depriving it from other humans who have equal worth? But whatever you think the ultimate truth maker for 
a statement like one is, in the end, it seems as though we're committed to there being some fact that sits out there that makes it the case that um, this moral judgment is true. And people feel a puzzle. How could there be a normative, prescriptive, or evaluative fact just sitting out there in the same way that the fact about the shape of the Earth just sits out there? And how could we know such a fact? Through what methods? It doesn't seem as though the usual methods in which we, which we use for ordinary descriptive statements would apply. And furthermore, if these facts are just sitting out there, um, why is there so much disagreement about them out there in the real world as there clearly is, for example, about something like the education of girls? Now, one way, of course, of responding to these puzzles is to think of moral facts as not merely sitting out there, but somehow or other grounded in the dictates of an almighty being. The facts don't just sit out there, they are God's commands. And even if we all believed in an almighty being, this would not be a good answer. And the reason, of course, was already very clearly pointed out by Plato. You don't want to say that something bad would have been good if God had willed it. The response would have to be that God, being essentially good, would never have willed a bad thing. But that presupposes an independent conception of good one to which God would now be answerable, rather than what one which he determines through his will. Another way of responding, I wasn't going to go into this, and I'm not, I won't go into this, um, is of course to kind of evoke not so much a supernatural being, but something like an ideal human judge, in the sense, in the sense of in the style of Hume, um, to, to, to be the truth maker for moral judgments. Uh, suffice it to say that those, those kinds of proposals have not worked out very well. Now, suppose that you are moved by these considerations, you're moved by the epistemological and metaphysical problems. Um, what should you do with judgments like uh, one if you are not going to treat them objectivistically? Well, the only real options and now here again, <laughs> but, uh, um, I'm going to not discuss one option that some people have taken to be very important, namely expressivism about morality. I th well, we can go into why in, in the Q&A. But I think the, the, real, the, the real options are to treat judgments like one, either along the lines of three or along the lines of four. That is to say, either by being nihilists about morality or by being relativists about it. And I'll say a little bit by way of explanation. So relativists, in my view, think that in some sense a judgment like one can be true, but not simply true. It can be true, but only true relative to something, a cultural or moral framework. The other option is what I'm calling nihilism. Nihilists think that statements like one are in some very basic sense confused because they contain normative vocabulary that could not possibly contribute to saying something true or false. Uh, and basically they think that moral statements should be dropped and we should talk only about what our preferences are, just as we basically do with statements about Brussels sprouts. And if you really there are people who also try to propose, I think what Crispin has done this, along these lines, a relativistic view about these taste judgments, but um, I, I'm not sure that we gain much uh, by doing that as opposed to simply say that we should drop talking about whether things are delicious or not and just talk about what your preferences are. You can always use that vocabulary to express your preferences, but it would be clear what the underlying Now, in the case of morality, uh, I think, you know, in the case of taste, I, I don't, it's an interesting question how much you lose if you simply stuck to talking about preferences. But in the case of morality, um, it would be a very harsh view. It's very hard to see how we can make do without some moral vocabulary. When you look at the major moral evils, 
one that chestnut that's always trotted out, I think is, is, is good to use because it's a very clear case, which is that one ought not to torture a baby for your own pleasure. Um, it's very hard to see how to describe the conviction that's expressed there simply by using the language of preference. I prefer to live in a world <coughs> in which um, people don't do that. That doesn't seem to me to come close to capturing what it is that we want to say. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, similarly, when we think of the great advances in moral thinking, the great moral progress that's been made, could we just say that while it used to be our preference to enslave people on the basis of the color of their skin, it's now our preference that we not do so? Of course, it is our preference that we not do so, but is that all it is so that if someone were to have a different preference, we could not accuse them of having made an error. So in the face of the above, relativism can seem like just the right solution. It allows us to hang on to moral discourse and even allows us to talk about its truth or falsity, but it avoids a commitment to impersonal normative facts by making moral truth in some sense dependent on our variable practices and attitudes. Unfortunately, I'll be arguing that relativism itself is not a coherent option, like morality is not a coherent option. The worry that relativism might not be a coherent view is, of course, a familiar one. Uh, but it's familiar largely in application to the idea that all facts are relative, what we could call a global relativism. And here the worry is a familiar one about self refutation. Um, but powerful as this familiar worry is, it doesn't apply in any obvious way to local relativism, that is, relativistic views about particular domains like that of morality. Um, nevertheless, I will be arguing that there is a substantial worry about how relativistic views of normative domains, such as that of morality, could be coherent. To see what the problem is, we need to formulate the view more precisely. Let's start with the question, what does it mean to relativize the facts of a given domain? Well, you know, we have very important examples of this that are drawn from science. For example, before Galileo, we used to think that there was such a thing as absolute motion. Things either moving or not moving. Um, but Galileo told us there is no such thing as absolute motion. There's only motion relative to a specified frame of reference, and moreover, none of these frames is more privileged than any of the others. To take another famous example, before Einstein's special theory of relativity, we believed there was such a thing as absolute simultaneity. Either two events were simultaneous or they weren't. Einstein taught us that we should not think that there is any such thing as the absolute simultaneity of two events separated in space but only simultaneity relative to a vari vari variable spatial temporal frame of reference, and that none of these frames of reference are any more privileged than any of the others. In both of these famous cases, what happens is that you start out with, a, with an absolute predicate, moves, or is simultaneous with, which we believe we can truly apply to the world. We become convinced, for good reason, that nothing in the world answers to that predicate, and that the most we can claim is that a close higher degree cousin of the predicate applies, moves relative to f, or is simultaneous relative to f. A lot of these things, by the way, you will locate on the handout if you can follow along. Um, so we recommend that people stop, I mean, this is, this is what happens in the physical case. You recommend that people stop talking in terms of the absolute predicate and start only talking in terms of its higher degree relativistic cousin. Moves gives way to moves relative to f, or is simultaneous with, gives way to is simultaneous relative to f, and we add none of these f's is more privileged than any of the others. Now these cases seem to provide us with a template for uh, generating a relativistic view of morality. Uh, thus, you know, we could take 
the absolute predicate, is morally right wrong, and we replace it with is morally right wrong relative to F. For example, instead of simply saying it's right to educate girls, we would have to say, on this relativistic view, it's right to educate girls relative to F. And the question is, what is F going to be in the moral case? We know what we're relativizing to in the case of motion or simultaneity, but what are we relativizing to in the case of morality? Now here there are two importantly different options, and they determine very different types of view. On the first, we relativize to some moral code or other, that is, to some persons or some communities background set of moral values. And we add, and none of these moral codes is more privileged than any of the others. On this view, which I would call for reasons that will emerge, a thoroughgoing relativism, we replace talk of X is morally right with X is morally right relative to moral code M. This is the most common formulation uh, of a relativistic view of morality. For instance, it's it's roughly what's going on in Gilbert Harmon's very well-known view. And I think there is a reason for that, which I will explain in a moment. On the second option, which I will call again for reasons that will emerge, well, I, I, I think I called it objectivist relativism on the handout, or, abs or is it absolutist relativism? Yeah. <coughs> For, for, for my purposes, I'm moving between those two terms um, without distinction. Uh, so that sounds like an oxymoronic uh, label, absolutist relativism. Um, and there is a reason for that. On that view, we replace X is morally right with X is morally right relative to circumstances C. Okay. Not a moral code, but a set of circumstances. These circumstances can be conceived very broadly. Any fact that might be relevant to the moral status of the act can be included in them, including facts about moral, what moral codes the various agents involved endorse. When people talk about moral relativism, they sometimes mean the one view and sometimes the other, often not distinguishing between them. But these are very different views. Let me like, first look at the relativization to circumstances. Now, given what I said at the start, you may be surprised to learn that I think there is nothing incoherent about this view. More than that, I believe that sometimes moral claims that are relativized to circumstances in this way are actually true. For example, if we ask, um, should I stop to help a motorist who has broken down on the side of the road, the answer is not a straight yes or a straight no. The correct answer is it depends on the circumstances. Roughly, if it's the middle of the night and it's freezing cold, you have nothing better to do, the person will perish unless you stop, yeah, you should stop. But if it's the middle of the day, you've got a medical emergency on your hands, there are lots of friendly people around to help the person anyway, you don't need to stop. So that seems right. Um, then, and there are, of course, lots of other examples. You ask, uh, should I leave someone who has served me a tip? I think that depends on the local customs. You know, in some places it's expected and needed. In other places it could be insulting. So it depends. I already gave the should I eat noisily or quietly example. That's similar. Um, we can also cite examples of such relativized claims that while coherent seem false. So for instance, if you ask, may I use children for fun? The answer does not seem to be, it depends on whether you will get caught. Okay. That one just seems like an outright prohibition. No, no dependence on circumstances. Um, may I kill an innocent person in order to harvest their organs and save a large number of people? It depends on how important the person in question is. Oh, no, it doesn't. Um, finally, there are examples of circumstance-relative claims that are controversial. People argue about them. So for instance, a lot of people argue about question, may I torture someone to obtain information? And a lot of people think, in that case, there is no absolute prohibition. It does depend on how large a calamity is at stake. Now, there's a lot of discussion about this, 
but it shows you people understand the question, they understand the notion of dependence, they argue that dependence applies. Now, given that I started out saying that I was going to argue against the coherence of moral relativism, how can I say that this sort of relativization to circumstance is not only coherent, but sometimes true? The answer is that while it may be perfectly legitimate to call this a type of moral relativism, if you want, relativism, of course, is a technical term, so you have a lot of leeway in how you get to use it, it's not the sort of moral relativism that can accommodate the metaphysical and epistemological motivations that motivated relativism in the first place, and which I outlined at the beginning of the paper. Okay. This is why it's very, very important in all, in all philosophical problems, I think, but especially here, um, what you have to do is tell us what work you expect a certain position to do uh, in order for us to be able to have a substantive discussion about whether the position is doing that work and is capable of doing that work. A lot of the times what you find is people arguing, is this a relativistic view or not, where that's a terminological issue. But nobody wants to argue about terminology because you can get to use the word pretty much as you like, especially in the philosophical context. But if you tell me, look, what I'm motivated by are the epistemological and metaphysical problems that I outlined, I can say, that's fine. I will now take a look at your view and see whether it's able to accommodate them. And the point about circumstance relativism is that it cannot accommodate those motivations. Now, the reason is that this kind of relativization does not escape the commitment to absolute or objective moral facts. For what statement like, and this is on the handout, if circumstances are C, then you ought to stop and help the broken down motorist, but if they are C star, then you are permitted to keep on going, says, is that six. It holds for everyone that he, she ought to, do, ought to help if circumstances are C, and holds for everyone that he, she is permitted to carry on if circumstances are C star. Now, this is the sort of content that moral claims have when they're relativized to circumstances. So if you were worried about how there could be impersonal normative facts, this sort of relativization <coughs> will not allay those concerns. There is just as much of a problem seeing how there could be impersonal normative facts of the form 7, you ought to do five circumstances or C, as there is about facts of the form, you ought to do fine no matter what the circumstances. In fact, if anything, seven is a little bit more complicated than the other one just says it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. This one tells you what you ought to do given the such and such circumstances. Now, I think this helps explain why a moral relativist like Gilbert Harmon relativizes not to a person's circumstances, but rather to his or her background moral code, adding that none of these codes is any more privileged than any of the others. With this relativization, which I call a thoroughgoing relativism, we have a real chance of getting away from a commitment to absolute moral facts of the kind that we were worried about. For when we say that the only moral facts there are are facts of the form, according to moral code M, one ought to do 5C, while insisting that none of these codes is any truer than any of the others, we really do seem to get away from the, the idea that there are objective facts about morality. For if we now ask if C ought we to do phi, the answer will have to be that depends. According to moral framework N1, yes, and according to moral framework N2, no. There are only facts about what your background moral values tell you to do, and none of these sets of values is any truer than any of the others. Naturally, no one would want to deny that people have background moral values, or that some normative claims follow from, or that some normative claims follow from those and others don't. And since that is all that a thoroughgoing relativist is committed to, it looks as though we have finally formulated a relativistic view about morality that is responsive to the concern about the metaphysical strangeness of objective moral facts. Now, the problem here is that this is not so much a relativism about moral judgment, as it is a nihilism about it, since any trace of normativity in the relativized moral judgment has been lost. 
If all I can say is things like 10, it's right to educate girls according to my moral code, and 11, it's wrong to educate girls according to the code of the Taliban. Then I've only said things with which everyone can agree, no matter what their moral perspective. Such judgments are merely descriptive remarks about what particular moral codes do and do not allow. And the upshot is indistinguishable from the limitivism or nihilism of that moral judgment. Now recall the idea was that relativism was supposed to be distinct from nihilism. It was supposed to be a way of retaining moral discourse while evading its supposedly naive commitment to objective moral facts by accepting only a relativized version of those facts. But if what I've said is right, then real relativism, one that has a prima facie chance of evading commitment to objective moral facts, does not do that at all. Rather, it ends up eliminating moral discourse, replacing it with purely descriptive remarks that are ill-suited to play anything like a normative role. So we seem to face a dilemma. We could relativize moral claims to circumstances or to background moral codes. On the first option, we get credible results, but nothing that evades commitment to objective moral truths. On the latter option, we avoid commitment to objective moral truths, but we preserve nothing of the original subject matter and so fail to distinguish the view from nihilism. Either way, we don't get something that the relativist said it was after, which is to avoid both the pitfalls of nihilism and objectivism. So I think uh, if the argument is correct, then this fundamental contention that Derek Parfit used to make, which is that if normativity is real, then it has to be objective, is, I think, supported. So where does that leave us? Have we now vindicated the, an objectivist conception of morality? Of course not. For one thing, if the argument up to this point is successful, all it shows is the conditional. If you want to continue making moral judgments, you had better be willing to count on some objective moral facts. Relativism will not allow you to both hang on to the discourse while distancing yourself from such facts. And this condition, of course, still leaves with the option that normativity is not real. Perhaps nihilism is correct, according to which we should simply we should drop normative vocabulary and simply talk about our preferences. For another, none of this tells us how to respond to the very real metaphysical and epistemological problems which motivated the skepticism about objectivism in the first place. So is there a way of deciding between nihilism and objectivism? Is nihilism a real option? I think if the only normative domain we were dealing with were aesthetics, nihilism would be a real option. It makes me sad to say this, because I find it very hard to believe that there are no objective facts about what is more aesthetically valuable than what. If I were to come across someone who thought that Barry Mandelow, just a big standard chestnut, was just as great a composer as Bach, I would find that absurd. I would behave like an objectivist bully, which is something I was often accused of doing. But unless I had an answer to the metaphysical and epistemological problems about objective value, this would remain just a conviction on my part. The idea that all that's really going on in such disputes is one person's preference over another would not have been refuted. But what about the case of morality? Is nihilism a real option in that case? Well, I've already said that it would be a very costly option that would leave us unable to say things that we desperately want to say, like, for example, that it's not a mere preference that we now disapprove of slavery. But just like in the case of aesthetics, while costly, I think it's not incoherent. Arguably, though, there is one normative domain in which nihilism is not a coherent option, and that is the domain of rationality. The objective facts that we don't have much choice about technology are facts about what you ought to believe given the evidential circumstance that you're in. Why do we have no choice but to acknowledge facts about rationality? Well, I mean, this will be very condensed, of course, for um, but to give you a sense of what that is, let's start with the famous paradox known as Moore's paradox. 
More paradoxical statement or utterance of the form of more one. P, but I do not believe that P. For example, Berlin is the capital of Germany, but I do not believe that Berlin is the capital of Germany. More one sentences are not outright contradictions. There is nothing self-contradictory about Berlin being the capital of Germany, and you're not believing it, or my not believing it, I should say. So what explains why it would be odd for someone to assert more one? The answer is that in uttering more one, and here, of course, I'm taking, I'm taking a stand on, on things that are discussed in the literature at great length, controversy still swirls about them. You are expressing, not asserting, your belief that Berlin is the capital of Germany, and then following that by denying that you believe any such thing. Because you're only expressing your belief and not asserting that you have it, it's not an outright contradiction, but, but nearly so. It's as though I were to make a point of taking some euros out of my pocket while saying, I have no money on me at all. Let's now consider the following elements, more too. Berlin is the capital of Germany, but I have absolutely no reason to believe that Berlin is the capital of Germany. There is a similar oddity in this utterance as there was about Moore's original sentence, but we would need to unpack this. As we've already seen, in saying in the first part of the sentence that Berlin is the capital of Germany, I'm expressing my belief that Berlin is the capital of Germany. Now, when we form beliefs in ways that we consider non-defective, we do so because we take ourselves to have reasons for forming those beliefs. We don't consider a belief to have been well formed if it was just believed on a whim. That is why more too seems so odd. In expressing your belief in P, you are simultaneously representing yourself as having a good reason to believe P, a, represent a representation that the second part of the utterance cancels. If this is right, then facts about rationality are presupposed by any judgment. That implies that they would be presupposed even by the judgment that we ought not to acknowledge facts about rationality on the ground that such facts would be problematic facts. If you say facts about rationality should be rejected since if they existed they would be problematic normative facts, you're tacitly presupposing that there are facts about rationality since you're claiming that the rational thing to believe given your arguments is that there are facts about rationality. If this argument works, we can't but acknowledge some normative facts since we can't but acknowledge some rationality facts. And according to me, to acknowledge some normative facts necessarily entails acknowledging some objective normative facts. Now, someone may say, well, this is all nice and fine, but our being committed to there being normative facts and there actually being normative facts are two different things. You may have shown that we human agents have no choice but to acknowledge rationality facts, but that doesn't mean that there actually are any. So unless you can show us how to deal with the problems that motivate it, a recoil from objective normative facts, all you would have done is landed us in yet another philosophical paradox of compelling arguments for, compelling arguments against the existence of objective normative facts. I think this complaint is completely legitimate, though I will say here, and give a little uh, indication why I say this, that at the end of the day, both the metaphysical and epistemological problems for normative facts be solved. Now, saying exactly how is not the task of a lazy Wednesday afternoon, <laughs> but I will give you a very quick indication, a very broad brush, why I feel optimistic on this score. Let's take first the metaphysical issue of how there could be impersonal normative facts built into the fabric of the universe. Uh, we tend to get puzzled by this because, as Wittgenstein liked to say, we're held captive by a picture. The picture, in this case, is the world of physical facts with which our senses seem to acquaint us. Movement of thought is something like this. Science has shown us that there is nothing other than particles in the void, so in particular there are no normative facts. And the basic flaw in this, in this crew is the crude claim that science has shown us that there is nothing other than particles in the void. First, science itself is knee-deep in entities that are not just particles of the void. For example, it's knee-deep in mathematics, 
which on any available account would involve postulating abstract objects, objects that lie outside of space and time. Second, science is far from giving us a complete picture of the world we know ourselves to live in. There are many important things which physics has not succeeded in explaining, which it may never be able to explain. And that's, of course, part of the agreement of this particular project. One obvious and enormously important feature is consciousness, one of those undeniable things. Morality may be a controversial and deniable, really. Uh, although, <laughs> of course, there's no position so absurd that somebody hasn't held it, but um, <laughs> This one is pretty solid. Another important domain, of course, is that of modality statements about uh, metaphysical necessity, possibility, logical necessity, logical possibility. None of this is explained by particles and the void. But finally, our very allegiance to science is based, as I've already argued above, on our confidence that the propositions of science are supported by good reasons, where this is, of course, enormous. Observation. So we can hardly use our belief in science as a reason for rejecting normative facts. Um, to put the point in a nutshell, if we have to postulate, as it might as might very well be the case, fundamental and irreducible truths about consciousness, about abstract objects, about modality, in order to account for some of our most basic cognitive achievements, why not fundamental truths about normative? well. What about the epistemological problem of knowing normative facts? Once more, there's a lot to be said, but one of the crucial points is that we're here in the domain of the a priori. And we know once again that we have to be able to explain at least how some a priori knowledge is possible. I say this not only because it's overwhelmingly plausible that we have a priori mathematical knowledge and a priori logical knowledge but also because we are fairly sophisticated accounts about how such knowledge is achieved, accounts that can clearly be applied to the case of morality and rationality. So all of this leads me to be confident that we can solve these deep problems and so that we should not be afraid of at least some measure of normative objectivism. Thank you. <laughs>